thrill seekers and that was a little snippet of a song called rainy day mushroom pillow which was recorded on an actual rainy day very rare here in southern california and not enough of you looked at that video so i'm advertising it here all right i started talking to my friend shows on jack haubner of the uh, youtube channel why do i always forget that called zen confidential about something that both of us were interested in and i pointed out to him a chapter in my book letters to a dead friend about zen which was kind of about what we were talking about and it happens to be kind of about what i've been talking about uh, on this uh, youtube channel yesterday so I'm going to read you some of that chapter. So the t conceit of this book uh, is, I guess the word is conceit, the, the thingy of this book <laughs> is that it is a series of letters I'm writing to my dead friend, Marky, who has just passed away about Zen, and he was not particularly interested in Zen. So that's all you need to know. And I will also point out that this chapter is true. These things really happened, but I changed a lot of the names and specifics because I was worried that the organization that was actually involved in this might uh, be litigious or litigious. So everything's been changed. So here we go. Marky, I am writing to you today from a really weird place. And I don't mean that I'm psychologically in a weird place, although that also happens to be true. The physical space I'm in is deeply weird. I think I'm in an actual cult compound. I suppose I ought to backtrack a bit. Earlier this year, I was invited to speak at something called the Worldwide Critical Buddhist Conference. The guy who invited me was a professor of comparative religions at Middlesex University in London. He told me that it was an annual gathering of folks interested in non-monastic Buddhism. He said they would put me up in a hotel in Portugal for the five days of the conference and allow me to attend all of its activities in exchange for my delivering a single one hour long talk. I looked the thing up on the web. It sounded legit and it fit into my schedule. So I said, cool, I'll do it. It turns out that the folks who sponsored that worldwide critical Buddhist conference are based here in Amadora, Portugal. Their leader is a Belgian guy who is considered a high-level Buddhist master in the Taiwanese Great Mountain Buddhist tradition. He's got those weird eyes I always associate with religious cult leaders, kind of glassy and hypnotic. He's in charge of the place I'm staying at right now. They actually did get me a hotel for the first few days, as promised, but for the past couple, I've been in his compound. A few days ago, I gave my talk at 9 a.m. at the start of the conference to a small audience that consisted mainly of Taiwanese guys in suits, most of whom slept through it. The only people who stayed awake for my talk were a group of students from Middlesex University. After a few days of other lectures by other people, some of which I wanted to sleep through, they took us back to the hotel. And I wrote this weirdly. I meant that every evening we went back to the hotel after the, the lectures. It kind of doesn't sound that way. After that, though, we all checked out of the hotel and they took us on a bus out to this place on a mountain a few hours drive outside the city. The bus was rocking like crazy as we went up the windy road. We were so close to the edge, I kept thinking we'd plunge into a ravine, but we made it. This place is huge. The guy who showed us around said it was built to accommodate 5,000 people. There is a six-foot-tall, gold-framed photo of the Belgian master on one of the altars in the main room. The room is the size of a mid-sized concert venue, the kind of place a band like the Ramones might have played in the mid to late 80s when they were starting to draw slightly bigger crowds. There were TV monitors all over the place, presumably so that folks in the back of the room would have a better view of the master while he was on stage. It's obvious that loads of people live in this compound. There are huts all over the place, and I see a lot of toys and strollers around, so there are families too. Somehow this makes it feel even more like a cult. There were a bunch of Buddhist scholars from all over the world here who were part of the conference. I've been talking to some of the Japanese scholars in Japanese, so the folks who run the place can't understand us. 
One youngish Japanese scholar told me he thinks this group is just like Om Shinrikyo, the people who in the 90s tried to jumpstart the apocalypse by putting the poison gas developed by the Nazis on the Tokyo subway system. Twelve people died and more than a thousand were seriously injured by, by the cult in the 90s. I hope they're not quite that bad, but dang, I'd better start checking these events out better before I say yes to them. I got a free trip to Portugal out of it, but I hope I don't also die here. Somehow, it seems like this might be a good time to write to you about some of the crazier aspects of Buddhism. One of the weirder aspects of Buddhism you probably would have been interested in when you were alive is called crazy wisdom. It's a phrase often used by Buddhist cult leaders to justify their breaches of standard Buddhist ethics. Crazy wisdom is the idea that sometimes wise people act crazy and maybe even seem to be unethical. The term comes out of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but you see a lot of folks in the Zen tradition acting kind of crazy too. The most famous of these is Ikkyu, the legendary Zen Buddhist monk who got drunk and hung out with prostitutes a lot. One of the foremost contemporary examples of so-called crazy wisdom was a Tibetan guy named Chogyong Trungpa Rinpoche. When Trungpa was just 18 months old, he was recognized as a reincarnation of a high Tibetan lama. He escaped Tibet's Chinese rulers when he was 20 years old, fleeing through the icy mountains on foot with a group of 300, only 13 of whom made it across the border to India. He went to England and started the first Tibetan Buddhist center in the Western world. Later on, Trungpa founded Naropa Institute in Colorado, the first Buddhist university in the West. He also set up the Shambhala Foundation, a huge organization for spreading Buddhist teachings. Trungpa's influence extends far and wide. I keep running into organizations and people who have associations with him. Chogyam Trungpa also allegedly screwed dozens of his students and then allegedly drank himself to death at age 48. I mean, it's for sure that he died when he was 48 and that he drank a lot. However, some folks dispute the connection. And then I give some examples of people disputing the, whether he was actually died of alcohol or not. And we'll go on. I never met Trungpa myself, but I knew a guy who worked for him as an instructor at Naropa Institute. He used to tell me wild stories about Trungpa's excesses. One time, this guy said, Trungpa told him that demons were going to fly in through this guy's window at night and tear him to bits. Apparently, the demons were going to take revenge for some offense this guy had committed against Trungpa. The demons never showed up. A different guy I once talked to told me about how he'd watched Trungpa down two 40 ounces of malt liquor during a public Dharma talk at his Zen center. Then there's the story I've heard from about half a dozen people about the time Trungpa forced a couple to participate in an orgy by ordering his uniformed guards to strip them naked against their will. That's a story that goes around. You can probably find it on the internet here. I'm not saying all these things really happened, because I don't know for sure. I'm just telling you about the kind of talk that's out there when people in the Buddhist community tell their stories of Trungpa. And yet, for all his alleged scandalous activities, Chogyam Trungpa is still revered by many people as one of the greatest Buddhist masters, decades after his death. Others ask questions. Was he merely a madman who conned thousands into thinking he was a wise master, or was his crazy wisdom really more wise than crazy after all. I've never been quite sure just what to make of Trungpa. His book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, is still one of my favorites on the subject of pursuing the Dharma authentically. Yet, by many accounts, he was a drunk and a sex fiend. Even some of his greatest admirers say that. He never tried to hide any of this, though. Perhaps that's what made it work. At the very same time as Richard Baker Roshi, head of the San Francisco Zen Center, was getting flayed alive for having an extramarital affair, Trungpa was allegedly out there screwing dozens of his followers and nobody was too worried, as far as I can tell. The difference may be that Richard Baker kept his affair, or affairs, some say there was more than one, hidden until he was caught, while Trungpa was completely blatant about what he did. 
So maybe sex isn't the real problem. Maybe the real problem is spiritual teachers who present themselves as one thing and then act completely contrary to that image. Whatever else you might say about him, Chugyam Trungpa did what he did out in the open for everyone to see. That way, nobody went into Trungpa's organization imagining him to be holy and pure and then became deeply disappointed when it turned out he wasn't. If you were going to study with Chugyam Trungpa, you had to accept the fact that he was a bo boozy womanizer right from the outset. Um, <clears throat> allegedly. Then there's the story of Ozil Tenzin. Tenzin was the man Trungpa appointed as his successor. It has been alleged that Tenzin liked to get it on just as much as his teacher. The problem was, it is alleged, that after Tenzin was diagnosed with HIV, he continued having unprotected sex for perhaps as long as three years without informing any of his many partners of his condition. Stephen Butterfield, a former student, said, In response to close questioning by students, he, Tenzin, first swore us to secrecy and then said that Trungpa had requested him to be tested for HIV in the early 1980s and told him to keep quiet about the positive result. Tenzin had asked Trungpa what he should do if students wanted to have sex with him. And Trungpa's reply was that as long as he did his Vajrayana purification practices, it did not matter because they would not get the disease. Now, this is also his word against everybody. Nobody really knows if uh, Trungpa really said that, but I didn't put that in the book, but let's go on. Tenzin's answer, in short, was that he had obeyed the guru, said Butterfield. Gosh. My sincere question here is this. Can a teacher be a lousy or at least questionable human being and still be the source of truth and wisdom? As I said earlier, I really like the one book of Trungpa's that I read. I've only read the one. There is definitely wisdom to be had there. In his book Sex and the Spiritual Teacher, Scott Edelstein points out that according to Buddhist philosophy, nobody ever remains exactly the same person throughout their entire life. In fact, what we are at any given time is as much a product of the environment we find ourselves in as it is in any in as it is any intrinsic personhood within us. Ugh. Weird sentence, Brad. Therefore, it's understandable that somebody could be wise at one moment and a jerk at another. Lots of people are like that. Why should Buddhist teachers be different? This doesn't excuse unethical behavior at all, but it helps explain how, for example, Chogyam Trungpa could write an amazing book about Buddhist practice in spite of his alleged drinking and partying and his allegedly questionable sexual activities. Still, it's better to be consistent. Furthermore, I think it is even better to be ethical. I don't condone the kind of unethical behavior I'm talking about here at all. I don't support it. I don't think anyone else should support that kind of behavior. If someone hears rumors that a teacher is doing unethical stuff, I think they ought to look into that. They should find out if the allegations are true, and if they are true, take whatever steps they can to rectify the situation. I tell folks all the time that if their master is doing weird stuff to them or to other students, they should speak out about it. It is not okay. In recent years, we've seen a lot of scandals within Buddhist communities. The late Edo Shimano, a Zen teacher in New York, was accused of sexually abusing his students, as was the late Joshu Sasaki, a Zen teacher in California. A whole bunch of other Buddhist teachers have also been accused of various sorts of abuses. Not all of the allegations are at the same level of badness, but these accus accusations do add up and create an image in people's minds about Buddhism. Some in the mainstream media have suggested that maybe there is something fundamentally wrong with Buddhism that leads to the abuses they've reported on. But they probably have never heard of the Noble Eightfold Path or the precepts. Most journalists are pretty sloppy about such stuff. And my God, in the ten years since this book has been published, we've seen a lot about journalists. That's pretty bad. Or if they do know about them, they probably figure all us Buddhist teachers just ignore them. We do not. I would suggest that the problem does not have to do with Buddhism, but rather with large religious institutions in general, and the effect that fame and power can have on a person, including the fame and power that come from being a spiritual leader. 
All the major Buddhist scandals I am aware of took place in large institutions. All those institutions grew at a very rapid pace. Comparable incidents have happened in Hindu, Christian, and Islamic institutions that were similarly large and grew at a similarly accelerated pace. The Hare Krishna movement, a Hindu-based group, is a good example. Early on in their history, they pushed for rapid growth and ended up empowering a whole lot of people as teachers who shouldn't have been teachers at all. They did this, it seems, because they felt their movement needed to get as big as possible as quickly as possible. It was a disaster, leading to allegations of sexual abuse, criminal activity, and even murder. Go look at the book, uh, what's it called? Monkey on a Stick. That's the one. It's out of print now, but you can still find it. It's lurid about the Hare Krishna murder and all the other crazy stuff. There, there was a trend in the early days of Buddhism in the West of organizations pushing for rapid growth. In Shoes Outside the Door, Michael Downing's book on the scandals at San Francisco Zen Center, SFZC, in the early 80s, we see how SFZC experienced rapid growth in the previous decade under the, under the leadership of Richard Baker. Meanwhile, Buddhist groups like Shambhala, the Zen Center of Los Angeles, Rinzaiji, and others also grew explosively. As documented in Shoes Outside the Door, several people asked SFZC's leader, Richard Baker, the same question. Does it have to be so big? That's what she said. Baker consistently ignored those who advised him to break the organization down into smaller independent units. But it's a very good question. Do Buddhist institutions really need to be so big? Do they really need to grow so fast? It's not hard to see why it seems advantageous for a Buddhist group to get really big really fast. Without a gigantic donor base for SFZZ, SFZC to draw from, for example, there wouldn't have been enough money and people power for huge projects like the Tassajara and Green Gulch monastic communities. There wouldn't have been enough money and people power for transforming their temple in the city into the gorgeous place it is today. The same is true of many other similar Buddhist organizations like the one I'm staying at right now. And I will say that this also makes those organizations fall prey to kind of pressure to conform with whatever's trendy at the moment, and I'm going to leave it at that. Now I'm going to skip over some of what I wrote because I want to keep this short, and here we go. In my experience of running a tiny Zen center in Los Angeles, which crumbled because of this outside pressure I'm going to talk about, or I, I've talked about, I think I can understand some of the unfortunate things that so often happen in larger groups. For example, I now see why large institutions so often fail to hold rogue teachers accountable. Once an organization of any size is established, that organization can start to take on a mind of its own. There are times when every individual member of an organization might be opposed to some action. Yet, if enough of those individuals think that the action would be beneficial to the organization, they'll accept it as a necessary evil. You end up with situations where no one wants to do the thing in question, and yet everyone goes along with it anyway for what they believe will be the good of the organization. Important point. Thank you. Another factor is that Buddhists in America and Europe are keenly aware that they are seen as a fringe religion. They're aware that the general populace doesn't know much about Buddhism and is inclined to be suspicious about it. When a teacher within such a marginalized religion starts behaving badly, there's a strong tendency to want to bury that information so that the religion as a whole doesn't get tarnished by it. It's seen as a danger to Buddhism itself to let these things be known. This is a legitimate fear. As I've said, since the scandals I just mentioned broke, there has been a lot of speculation that Buddhism itself is to blame. And I'm going to skip over a little bit. The larger the institution, the more at stake there is. A small group might be able to get rid of a bad teacher without too much being lost. There's usually not mon much money involved and few people who will be hurt. Plus, in general, a scandal within a small organization isn't very interesting to the media or to the outside world. A larger institution has a lot more to lose. A scandal in a big institution based on a fringe religion looks much juicier to folks with a 24-hour news cycle to feed. Furthermore, large institutions are often the main financial support for many people within them. 
If a big institution goes down as the result of a scandal, it can be truly devastating to the livelihoods of everyone involved. So again, there is more incentive to try to keep the truth buried. And then I go on another rant, which is, uh, if I do pat myself on the back, I think it's pretty good, but I'll leave it. And uh, at the end, I uh, talk about how I did escape from that compound and live to see another day. They didn't kill me. So there you go. I thought that might be interesting. The book, again, is Letters to a Z Dead Friend About Zen, and you can still find it on your favorite. Uh, it's, it's also available as an audiobook and on your favorite uh, bookstores and apps and whatever you got. So there you go. Uh, so, that's it. Uh, if you want to support me not having to go to Buddhist compounds to uh, make a living, you can give me a donation at uh, the URL that you're seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That's where you'll find my PayPal and Patreon accounts, uh, the links to them. And as always, if you don't want to support me, you don't have to support me. So we'll see you uh, next time. Have a good time all the time. And... As a special treat, a lot of people seem to think Ziggy does nothing but lay around all day, uh, and he's often laying around like he is right now when I'm making my videos, but here is a bit of video I took yesterday of him chasing a cat. Where'd the cat go? Where'd the cat go? I think the cat's gone. I think the cat went inside.